Today, we have some significant NHL trade rumors. We have a major update on Elias Pettersson's situation with the Canucks. Although things look like it's going to likely end with a contract extension, trade talks were picking up and we're really close to sending him to an Eastern Conference team. We'll discuss what we know about that situation. We also have some other trade rumors tonight regarding teams like the Vegas Golden Knights, the Montreal Canadiens, the Calgary Flames, Boston Bruins, and the Detroit Red Wings. We also have some significant injuries injury updates, including another significant injury for Senators, centerman Josh Norris. A couple of coaches have been fined $25,000 for uh, how they've handled themselves with officials. Plus, we have a crazy leaf stat that I want to discuss with you as well regarding them and the Coyotes. All that coming up next. So welcome back to another video here at Top Shelf Honk. As I mentioned, we have a lot to pack into tonight's video, so let's get started here. Uh, news from the NHL waiver wire. No huge surprise. The Philadelphia Flyers had goaltender Cal Peterson on waivers. He has cleared, so he's been reassigned to the American Hockey League. Um, no other activity here today. Uh, some injury updates. We saw the Ottawa Senators do battle with the Nashville Predators and had a lot of players leave that game banged up. The most significant, though, centerman Josh Norris, uh, who ended up with yet another shoulder injury. He's already had two major shoulder surgeries in his young career. And this one could be a potential situation as well. We don't know the full extent of it, and we don't know if surgery is required. But essentially, it's just really bad luck on his part. Uh, he was going around the net. He kind of got a forearm shimmer and went into the, the back bar in the middle of the net. He went into it pretty hard. And when he went off of the ice, he kind of had that dead arm look when you have a major shoulder injury. I don't know if it's a labrum or what exactly it is, but... Uh, all we know is head coach Jacques Martin did confirm that he was going to be out for an extended period of time. We don't have a definitive timeline. Could it be season over? We don't know that. There's not a ton of runway left this year. I mean, you'd think even a best case scenario for him, you know, probably like most injuries of that magnitude, even if it's not real severe, probably looking at, you know, especially with his history, at least four to six weeks. That's getting pretty darn close to the end of the year. I honestly have a gut feeling that Josh Norris' season is over and he's going to have another long recovery. Uh, what this means for next year and beyond, it's not quite clear. Uh, this does give the Senators the option of putting Norris on long-term injured reserve and will create some much-needed cap flexibility, although that's likely going to be coming in the next week anyways, as a couple of their pending UFAs are expected to be moved, uh, which would give them some more flexibility anyhow. But this might allow them to um, not only you know, get some flexibility from moving some UFAs, but this might allow them to weaponize that additional cap space for the rest of the year to maybe act as a broker uh, with some other deals. Uh, they could maybe get involved and pick up some extra draft currency. Even if they don't intend to use those picks, it could be extra uh, assets to have because we know that Steos is likely going to be wheeling and dealing to improve this team for next year. So even if he doesn't do a lot of buying right now, he could possibly get some extra assets to help him with that case uh, in the offseason. So we'll see. But Norris, is, it didn't look good. I feel terrible for the guy. Uh, he's worked so hard and had such bad luck. Um, I just hope he's not dealing with the same thing that kept him out for like eight, nine months before. Uh, we also saw Thomas Shabbat um, and Tim Stutzla and Jake Sanderson all get banged up as well, which is really like the, the heart of their lineup here. But the other three all appear to be minor stuff and are expected, at least at this point, to return and play for the next game. Artem Zub also expected to return as well. Now, in Toronto, uh, they got Joseph Wall has been activated from long-term injury reserve. He is playing. He's the, By the time this hits YouTube, the game will already be started. But Joseph Wall is expected to start tonight for the Leafs. I'd be curious to see how that goes. Uh, crazy stat, though, involving the Toronto Maple Leafs. Get this, the Toronto Maple Leafs have not won a home game against the Arizona Coyotes since October 17th, 2002. That feels like an eternity. I mean, we're in 2024. But here's the crazy thing about that. I mean, that's crazy enough. Well, I guess you could say that's crazy enough on its own. Considering the Coyotes being in the opposite conference would normally only make one 
uh, appearance at the Maple Leafs Arena per season, that's still a long stretch of games. The crazier thing, though, is October 17th, 2002, when the last time this happened, when they beat the Coyotes at home, that's also the birth date of Matthew Nyes, who was born in Phoenix, Arizona. That's just kind of crazy. Um, the last time the Leafs beat the Coyotes at home was when Matthew Nyes entered the world uh, being born on that day. Uh, that's just kind of a weird thing. So I'm going to say maybe because of the connection, I have a funny feeling tonight the Leafs are going to break that streak, beat the Coyotes, and also Nyes is going to have a big role in it. So we'll see where that goes. But I just thought that was a really interesting thing, thing stat, whatever you want to call it. And well, when I hear things like that, I like to bring it up and let you guys know so that you can see what you think as well. Um, some other news regarding coaches being fine. Sheldon Keefe, the head coach of the Leafs, and Don Granato, the head coach of the Sabres, both announced by the NHL today that they were fined $25,000 a piece uh, for separate incidents uh, regarding basically their interactions uh, with the NHL officials. You can kind of call it, uh, you know, the language abuse of officials, whatever you want. We saw Keith get kicked out of the game uh, the other night. Uh, certainly didn't seem like, like it didn't seem all that aggressive. Like he wasn't throwing things. He wasn't yelling. It was kind of a weird scenario, but uh, obviously the refs didn't appreciate and like what he had to say to them and they kicked him out of there. Um, so they've both been fined. Uh, you would think, I bet you he has regrets for not making a bigger deal about it because if you're going to get fined and pay that kind of money, you know, he, he probably was trying to keep himself in check and kind of keep it toned down so that didn't happen. But that's not the case in those situations. Um, some other news regarding the Vegas Golden Knights and their potential trade deadline um, plans. Darren Dreger, NHL insider for TSN, is reporting that the Mark Stone injury, I know a lot of people really were quite opinionated when the news broke that Mark Stone was going to be out for an extended time and was heading for a long-term injury reserve. I've seen a lot of people automatically roll their eyes and be like, oh, here we go again. Here's the Vegas LTIR special. He'll probably return for game one of the playoffs. And you know what? If he does return for game one of the playoffs, I will be suspect of that as well. Um, but I don't think that's going to be the case. Uh, Mark Stone does have a significant, serious, legit injury. I've seen it from enough sources that I believe it. He has a lacerated spleen. Uh, all indications from my research, because it's not a com real common hockey injury, it's about at least a three, if not closer to six-month recovery. So Dreger is saying that based on my research, it kind of backs up what he was saying, that Stone's definitely out for the rest of the regular season, and he's questionable for playoffs. I will be quite surprised if he magically appears in game one of the Stanley Cup playoffs. Now, could he return late first round, second round, third round, depending on how far they go? That's a possibility. Uh, I mean, at this rate, you know, you're probably looking at, I would say, you know, sometime in May would probably be the earliest, but it could be longer. And really, if it's closer to the six month mark, he could be well into the summer. So, the end of the day, the Vegas Golden Knights are definitely expected to max out that possibility or come as close to it as they can for the LTIR pool that they're gaining here by having Stone out. They would rather would have Stone in the lineup, of course. He's their captain, their leader, and a you know terrific hockey player. But their need to add on the wing has just intensified. And now with that kind of LTIR money, I wouldn't be shocked if they tried to add multiple wingers. Uh, this is a team that we know is arguably the most aggressive out there. They do not care about future assets one little bit. They've been that way since day one of the franchise. They want to win at all costs now, every year. And eventually, will it catch up to them? It will. At some point, barring some crazy luck that goes the opposite way, I don't know when, but in a few years down the road, at some point, Vegas is likely going to be a bad team and have their struggles because they don't have the young players coming in to replace the guys that are aging out. But at the end of the day, that's what weighs off. They still have a lot of players that have a lot of runway left, but a lot of their top players are all in like at an older team, all in their 30s. You look at, you know, look at the back end with Martinez and Petrangelo. Uh, you know, you've got obviously Stone. <coughs> obviously, Mark Stone. 
not really old, but not super young anymore. Marsha sells well into his 30s now. Um, you know, they do have some players that still have some youth on their side as well, you know, but not a ton of it, you know, and it, it, this is going to catch up. But they will definitely do everything they can to acquire at least one significant winger, maybe more. Um, some names to watch with Vegas it would include Pavel Buchnevich in uh, St. Louis. I think he might be right near the top of their list because he comes with a term. Uh, he has an extra year in his contract. Jake Genzel, there's been rumored to be interest there as well. That's no no secret. Um, I think there's more teams in on Genzel uh, than Buchnevich right now, but Genzel's you know, pretty darn good playoff performer. And even Tarasenko might be a fallback option for teams like Vegas. Uh, Tarasenko also rumored to be getting some interest from his former team that he played with last year after the deadline, the Rangers. Um, the Rangers also reportedly in talks, though, with the Ducks. There's been a lot of uh, scouting and meetings reportedly going on there about possibly returning Frank Vitrano to the Rangers, maybe even with Adam Henrique involved in some capacity because we know the Rangers really want to add uh, down the middle. Um, so there's possibility that they could see a deal between the Rangers and Ducks. Uh, but one of these wingers, one of these top wingers that are, you know, 30, uh, well, I guess Tarasenko is a former 30 goal guy, but he's still a pretty good, you know, performer at this rate of his career. But Gensel and Buchnevich, 30 and 40 goal scorers respectively, that would be a good add. Uh, so you know Vegas is going to do everything they can and they'll, like I said, they'll mortgage the future to get as much as they can to make sure they're as strong as possible for the playoffs. Uh, in Calgary, there's now reports from Anthony DeMarco, the fourth period.com. We know the Flames are still going to be busy with a Noah Hannafin trade, but right now, according to DeMarco, they're not expected to trade Jacob Markstrom. Apparently, they've had a change of heart there. They were seriously considering it. Uh, they had some good conversations with the Devils. We know things went quite far. There were advanced talks to get to the point that they asked Markstrom about waiving his no uh, trade clause, which he was willing to do. Um, some details involving salary retention caused it to not happen. Um, there's couldn't agree on everything. Of course, I think the trade package for the most part was agreed to, but either the flames willingness to retain more than the New Jersey wanted or what they valued that extra retention being a lot of times that's a problem too. teams will be like, well, you want us to retain, you know, that's going to cost you an extra second round pick, first round pick, what have you. And if the other team that's buying doesn't want to do that, well, then sometimes it falls apart. So, but the, the confusing part for me is his remarks were that the Flames don't want to move Markstrom because they want to send the right message to the team. They just traded Chris Tanev yesterday. Noah Hannafin, we know, is going out the door sometime in the next week. You've already traded Nikita Zadorov and Elias Lindholm. This would be the fourth player that's fairly key to your team that you've traded during this season. You're looking like you're heading for that mushy middle at best, which is the place that the Calgary Flames have found themselves way too long, way too often, you know, not quite good enough to make uh, either get into playoffs or if you do, it's a first round loss or not quite bad enough to get a really high pick. And they're going to do it again. They have an opportunity here, but I don't understand what kind of message this is. And to me, this is likely because they're in the playoff mix. And I'm sure their owner would like to have, even if it's only two or three home dates, you know, they do make a lot of money. So um, interesting to see there. But when it comes to Hannafin, he's obviously the top player available um, widely regarded as the, the top puck moving defenseman. Of course, Tanev going will have an impact, but not necessarily. I, I think teams that were interested in Hannafin looking at the Tanev deal and going, I like that. You set the market lower than we expected. But there's there's rumors out there that they might be looking for more than one, like multiple first round picks or a first round pick and a very recently first round draft prospect. That's a lot. I don't know how many teams are going to want to give that up, but we know that the Lightning have been a team that keep coming up lately with Hannafin. Of course, Sergachev is out. Um, left shot defenseman plays a similar role for his team. I don't know if they could figure out extending Hannafin. Noah Hannafin going to Tampa on a long-term extension being included could make it so they can't re-sign Steven Stamkos next year. You look at their roster, you look at cap friendly, 
There's not much there for um, expiring deals. Stamkos being the, the key one. And they don't have a ton of space. And if they spend that space or most of it on Hannafin, that could end Stamkos' future there. I don't know if they do that. Or, I mean, not to say that they couldn't make other moves in the summer, but it would really complicate things and kind of put them from trading from a spot of weakness as time goes on too. So we'll see. But Tampa's in the mix there. There's still some about New Jersey, but there's some thought that they may not be the aggressive buyers we were thinking a few weeks ago because they haven't been able to get themselves closer to a playoff spot. Uh, Boston's still very much in the mix when it comes to Hannafin as well. Uh, They could look to move money either through a deal with the Flames or elsewhere to uh, free up the room to, to bring him back to where he started. Uh, obviously not where he started, but where he grew up. Um, so the Bruins, for example, uh, to talk to switch gears from Hannafin to the Bruins and how that could work. The Boston Bruins reportedly uh, have had no contract extension talks with forward Jake DeBrusque or defenseman Matt Grizzlick. Both seemed quite concerned when asked by reporters about their futures. Um, certainly whole different case. I mean, DeBrusque um, has, hasn't had the greatest season. Uh, Grizzlick, I think the Bruins do value him but I think they would value Hannafin a whole lot more. Um, could there be some sort of package you know, involving Boston and Calgary to bring Hannafin back for those two guys? Now, there would have to be something else involved. Right now, it's believed the Flames are, like I said, looking for probably three to four pieces on Hannafin with a first-round pick being included and a prospect you know, relatively equivalent to that. I'm not sure what prospect they would want from Boston. I, I think Boston would move um, former first rounder Fabian Lizell. I don't think he's got a future in Boston by the looks of things. Um, maybe I'm wrong, but that's the feeling I've got watching their some of their prospects lately. Um, you know, would Lizell a first to Bruskin and Grizzly get it done? I mean, from a money perspective, it could happen. So we'll see, though. The Bruins are in the mix and. If the Bruins want to make a significant addition and there is some talk of that they're really considering it and having trade talks, those might be some roster players that go out to make the money work. So we'll see on that one. Uh, And that front, Montreal Canadiens defenseman David Savard has been a defenseman that we know the Hams have been outspoken about and not necessarily wanting to trade. I've heard comments in recent weeks from Ken Hughes saying that he wasn't really looking to trade Savard. He's under contract for another year. But with the uh, Chris Tanev trade taking place and him being off the market, if you take a look at what else is out there for defensemen, it's, you know, there's not a ton of defensemen that play that style of game. And David Savard may not be the flashiest guy out there, but he's going to give you a strong work ethic defensively. He's going to give you a lot of good PK time, block some shots, and just a real battler, warrior type of defenseman that goes out there. They've got a good experience, um, and there's, you know, lots to like. Now, like I said, they don't have to move. He's not a pending UFA, but I think that the interest in the offers are likely going to pick up, which is probably going to tempt the Habs to actually get something done. Of course, they're still expected to try to move Jake Allen. Not sure where things stand. It's been kind of quiet on that front as of late. Uh, one of the teams mentioned with Savard could be a reunion in Tampa where he won the Stanley Cup before signing with the Hams as a free agent. Uh, the, the Lightning, as I mentioned, are in on multiple D uh, as well as Hannafin. They probably wouldn't necessarily do both guys, but they're they're going to probably try to get one or the other with Hannafin likely being their top target. So we'll see on that front now here's the craziest news of the day Uh, we talked recently about the future of Elias Pettersson in Vancouver and wondering does he really want to commit there and could it actually end up resulting in a trade now I don't think many people expected a trade to happen by trade deadline but maybe in the summer obviously he's a pending RFA and that doesn't mean anything nowadays I know it's not a case where he can just walk but we've seen a lot of RFAs most notably Matthew Kachuk use that status to get what they want and to move even though he's not a UFA. Uh, He basically was able to turn the the momentum here in negotiations to say, I'm not signing. And at the end of the day, they could sign one-year deals and be UFA and get what they want. If they want to be playing hardball and say, I'll sign for one year and then I'm out. So when teams know that, they're going to trade you because they're not going to want to lose you for nothing, especially when you're a huge, important piece of their franchise. Um, but all the rumblings around Pedersen and the future in Vancouver 
definitely had something to it. Ellie Friedman was reporting just a short time ago this evening that there was significant and advanced trade talks between the Vancouver Canucks and the Carolina Hurricanes involving Elias Pettersson, and they were so advanced it got to the point that Vancouver had to take this to Pedersen and kind of, you know, talk about the future and see, you know, do you really want to get negotiations going or what? We know we've seen reports from Frank Valley of DailyFaceoff.com just in the past 24 hours indicate that a significant Progress has been made on an eight-year contract extension with Pedersen, something in the neighborhood of about $100 million over the, the eight years. Um, and there was belief as well that he said that it was his understanding that Pedersen went to the Canucks. They had a conversation about his future and that he just, with all the rumors floating around out there and everything, that he just decided he wants to get all the silliness uh, done with and get this contract done that he wants to stay in Vancouver. And now we're hearing from Friedman essentially that those conversations, probably the way Frank described it, were pretty close and pretty accurate. But it sounds like they're saying essentially, like, if you can't commit to us, we have this really significant trade offer that we really like and that we don't want to do it. But at the end of the day, if you don't want to be here, we have to do what's best for the team. Ultimately, the belief here is that a couple of roster players included in this Carolina offer included Marty Natchez and Jesperi Kakaniemi. There's some people think maybe Brad Pesci's name was brought up. Uh, but likely, at the very least, uh, Marty Natchez, Kakaniemi, a first-round pick, and their top prospect, maybe Nikishin or something, um, that probably would have been quite enticing for the Canucks to at least seriously consider it. At the same time, do they really want to move their top centerman, 100-point player? No, not really. I'm sure they don't want to. But if he doesn't want to commit to them, you have to do what's best for your team and your franchise. It's just that simple. And so after taking this and having these conversations with Pedersen, they decided that they would rather sign him and convinced him to, or I guess had talks to to restart negotiations. Pedersen gave the A-OK to his reps who are J.P. Barry and Pat Brisson to uh, to get back to the table and negotiate. And now at this point, I can't say it's imminent, but it should be done soon enough that an eight-year $100 $100 million mega extension is expected to be done for Pedersen. Now, throughout those negotiations, if they do hit any snags, could they resume talks? I guess it's possible. And I would suspect that if Pedersen really wants to stay, that maybe, I don't, I'm not really sure we can say he lost any leverage here because at the end of the day, he's still the one on the ice producing at a very high level. Um, you can't replace that as much as some of these trade packages would be intriguing. Uh, you can't win. You can't win those deals. Uh, Marty Natchez is an excellent player. The prospect involved, excellent pro, you know, possible player. First round pick could be a really good player. Are they, any of those guys going to be Pedersen equivalent? Not likely. It's impossible to win those deals. So at the end of the day, it sounds like cooler heads are going to prevail. Progress has been made, and we should see an extension soon enough. But it's not. Uh, it's pretty crazy to think that if uh, things could have stalled a little longer, if Pedersen wouldn't have kind of given in to getting back to the negotiating table, that he could end up being a Carolina Hurricane by the trade deadline. Uh, and I don't think anybody thought that things were that serious or that advanced when it comes to these um, rumors that were out there. So I guess uh, at this point, like I said, it's expected that a contract extension will be reached an agreement on, but knowing that how serious the hurricanes have been, if they do run into any other snags, we will be curious to see if this ever comes up again. So let me know your thoughts on all today's news and rumors down in the comments. We'll discuss further. If you're new to the channel, of course, make sure you subscribe and stick around. We'll keep you up to date with all the news, rumors, and analysis of all 32 NHL teams. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you next time.